Good day to you learners. Hope you are doing fine. In today's lesson in Integrated Science, we are going to look at the diversity of living and unliving things. How can we differentiate between living and unliving things? Also, what are some of the features that distinguishes between living and unliving things? We'll be looking at um, the cells, we'll looking at the types of cells, we'll be looking at the seven life processes, looking at the kingdom, the phyla, the class, or the classification in general, yes. So let's jump into our first part, the characteristics of living and non-living things. Now, we can use this acronym, that's the remind R, to differentiate between living and non-living things. Now, living organisms, such as plants and animals, can be distinguished from non-living things, such as stones, tables, book, pen, remote, etc., by the seven life processes we have here. That's a remind R. Remind R. Please take note of this acronym. Remind R. So the first R is respiration, the E is excretion, the M is movement, the I is irritability, the N is nutrition, and D for development, and R for reproduction. Now let's take the first one. Why are we saying respiration is one of the life processes of living organisms? Now, respiration is a breakdown of food. So it's a breakdown of food with or without the use of oxygen to release energy, carbon dioxide, and water. And energy is needed to perform the life processes. So in plants, they require, they, they respire during the daytime, taking in carbon dioxide and giving out oxygen and with animals they respire by taking in oxygen and giving out carbon dioxide both day and night so with plants since they take in carbon dioxide during the day it's not advisable to sleep under a tree at night because the process is re reversed because they take in carbon dioxide and at night Photosynthesis does not occur because they need sunlight to convert the raw material. And sunlight is not present at night. So this will lead to suffocation and can cause death. Okay, let's look at the next one, excretion. Excretion simply means getting rid or the removal of metabolic waste product or substances from the body of an organism. So if these metabolic waste substances or products are not removed, the cells will be poisoned and reactions will slow down and death may occur. So in plants, plants have no special excretory organs to remove metabolic waste products. But with animals, they have special excretory organs to remove metabolic waste material. So movement refers to the moving of the cell contents. Or part of the body so living things move plants and animals also move but with plants it's, it's not quite visible the movement of plants are not so obvious as they are generally fixed in the soil but however they extend the tips of their roots and stems so uh, they're moving away <laughs> so a few unicellular water plants on the other hand show active movement with the animals they move about freely in search of food shelter or to escape danger let's look at the next one irritability irritability so Sensing changes in the environment that is a stimulus or the stimuli and responding to them 
is irritability. So living organisms are able to detect and react or respond to the conditions or changes around them. So with plants, plants react slowly to external stimulus such as light, heat, touch, and gravity. But with animals, this is very quick. They react very fast to external stimulus such as heat, light, touch, and gravity. Okay, let's look at the next one. That's the N, nutrition. Nutrition simply means you are taking in food to get the nutrients for the body to grow, right? Okay, good. So plants are self-feeding. They are self-feeding. And combine carbon dioxide and water in the presence of light and chlorophyll to make food as photosynthesis. But animals are other feeding, that's heterotrophic. They depend on other organisms for food. So they eat from the plants. So green plants that are able to prepare their own food through the process of photosynthesis. This mode of nutrition is called holophytic or autotrophic. That's the self-feeding, autotrophic or holophytic. They produce their own food. Then with the animals, they get their food from plants. And this mode of nutrition is known as a holozoic or heterotrophic nutrition. Okay, so hope you had that one. Okay, now let's look at the last R. That is, sorry, the D, that's uh, development and growth. Development and growth. Okay, so living organisms convert food into cells. And this increase in number of cells causing the organism to increase in size. So with plants, they, are, they show indefinite growth. So for example, in flowering plants, most growth occur at the tips of the roots and shoots. This is known as the apical growth. Then with animals, they ex exhibit definite growth. So in animals, growth occurs in all parts of the body equally. All parts of the body equally. But with plants, it occurs at the, sh at the tip of the shoots and the roots. Okay, so let's look at the last R of our life processes and that is reproduction reproduction so this is a process whereby living organisms are able to meet to produce fertile offsprings or to produce offsprings of on the of their own yes so so this process ensures that species that's a kind of organisms survive generations after generations Yes, yeah, so that is it. So I hope you had it. Remind R. Respiration, excretion, movement, irritability, nutrition, development, and growth and reproduction. So we are saying that living things undergo these seven life processes. But non-living things do not undergo these seven life processes. Do book, stone, pen, pencil undergo these life processes we just explained? The answer is no. Okay. So let's move on to the next one. Biodiversity. Biodiversity. So many people believe that it's wrong for humans to damage natural habitats and cause that to or cause that of animals and plants. So what is biodiversity at all? Biodiversity refers to the variety of different organisms that are living in a particular area. The variety of different organisms that are living in a particular area. So this is what we term as the biodiversity. So there are many reasons given for trying to maintain the biodiversity. One is losing organisms may have unexpected effects on the environment, such as the erosion caused by deforestation. Also, 
losing organisms may have effect on other organisms in their food web. So in attempt to preserve the habitat and keep species alive is called conservation. I hope this point is well explained. Okay, so let's look at the next one in our topic, that's classification. Since we are preserving them, let's try to classify the organisms in the environment. Okay, when we say classification, what does it mean? Okay, classification means to put things in classes or groups, to group things, right? Okay, very good. So classification refers to the sorting out of living things and putting them into groups based on their common characteristics. Putting the organisms into groups based on their common characteristics. So any group you pick, make sure that group of organisms exhibit the same or have common characteristics. So let's look at the history of classification. The historical background of classification, who brought this classification and what can we learn from it? Okay, so classification of things, of, of living things, began long ago in the 4th century by a Greek philosopher called Aristotle. Aristotle in 384 to 322 BC, before the common era. So he classified animals by looking at the way they move, and he put all animals that fly or run or swim into one group. So these flying animals will include bats, insects, birds and some kind of flying fish you know so but this mode of uh, grouping is not good because the members do not have anything in common except the movement they they fly that's it so in in this classification we saw that aristotle used appearance and sizes as a way of classifying things even in plants. He grouped plants into herbs, shrubs, and trees. But a, new, a scientist also saw the work of Aristotle and made some corrections. So the mode of classification system used today is based on the work of the great Swedish biologist known as the Carolus Linus. Carolus Linus. So his classification was based on natural relationships and also he brought together organisms according to the things they have in common. They have in common. So this system of classification gave every organism its own distinctive two-part name called a binomial system. So we have seven we have seven ranks or taxa which are recognized by all scientists all over the world. And they are one kingdom, two phylum or division, three class, four order, five family, six genus, seven species. Now, the biggest and the largest and the first taxa or rank is the kingdom. Biologists group all things into five kingdoms. And these five kingdoms are the prokaryotic or the monera, the protoctista, the fungi, plantae, and animalia. The five kingdoms are prokaryotic or the monaria, protoctista, fungi, plantae, and animalia. 
Now, when you come down from the kingdom, we have the phylum or the division. So this is the smaller division of the kingdom. So we are breaking the kingdom down to phylum, break the phylum to class, the class to order, the order to family, then family to genus, then genus to species. Yeah, so with the phylum, is a smaller division of the kingdom and it's a group of related classes. So organisms within this group may have the same body plan. So those animals that have the backbone may be put in a different phylum from those that do not have the backbone, but they, they, they may belong to the same kingdom. I hope you are getting it. Okay, the next one is the class. There is also a smaller division of, within the phylum. So organisms in a class have more common characteristics than those of the phylum. Then, order. The order is a subgroup within a class. So the organisms in each other resemble each other than those of the same class. So example, human beings and elephants are in the same class mammalian, but different orders. Did you get it? Aha. Uh -huh. So uh, Carolus Linus system is trying to tell us that even though some organisms may be classified as uh, may be classified under the kingdom Animalia, they have different, different, different structures or features or characteristics so as we move down then we sort them into the class or the family or the order or the genus and the species i hope you are getting what i'm saying okay now let's look at the family it is a group of related similar genera organisms in their family resemble one uh, one another more closely than those of an order. For example, frog and toad, ape and human beings, they resemble, right? Yeah. So frog and toad at times, it's kind of confusing. Now the next one, a genus and the species. A genus and the species. So members of a genus have similar features and are closely related, but do not produce fertile offspring. But with a fit, this is the basic or lower unit of classification consisting of a population of closely related and similar organisms. So individuals of the same species can interbreed freely. They, they can interbreed or mate freely with each other to produce fertile offsprings. Okay. So let's look up the binomial nomenclature binomial nomenclature this is it so the binomial nomenclature or the system of nomenclature refers to a linear system where every living organism is given two part latin names two part latin names so I've given you one example here. That's the Magnifera indica. That's the, the name for mango. So the first Latin name is Magnifera. And it starts with a capital letter. Now, all the names are written in italics. All the, name, all the names are written in italics. But the first, that's the genus, starts with a capital letter. Now, since you are going to use a pen, write it as normal and underline it. If the name is not in italics, you can underline them. So you have only two conditions. Write it in italics or use your normal writing and underline them as separate words i hope it's clear so the first one starts with a capital letter known as the magnifera which is the genus 
then the indica is the species very good so these are some of the examples um homo sapiens homo sapiens and that's for man the name for man homo is a genus species is what sapiens good another domestic dog we have the canis familiaris Canis, the genus familiaris, is the species. We also have, okay, the canis is for, is called the domestic dog, yeah. Then we have the gallus domesticus, that's the house fly, house fowl. Gallus domesticus, that's the house fowl. Yes, so, okay, all right, so I hope it's clear. Yes, yeah, so these are the Latin names. And let's look at the next one advantages or reasons for classifying organisms advantages for classifying organisms but before i talk about the advantages let me go back to the kingdom explain and give examples of examples under the kingdom and get back to the advantages so let's go back to the kingdom. Okay. Now we said we have five kingdoms. The prokaryotic or the monera. They are unicellular organisms and they are microscopic. Example the blue green algae and bacteria we have the protoctista they are they are also unicellular organisms example the protozoa known as the amoeba paramecium plasmodium that causes malaria trypanosoma that causes sleeping sickness also green algae and slime mold they are, they, they are for medical studies, yes, so that's the protoctista. I hope you've heard of amoeba, paramecium before, even the plasmodium and the trypanosoma. Then the next one is the plantae. They are multicellular organisms that uses chlorophyll to manufacture their own food. So example, we have the liverwort, the mosses, the ferns. Okay, then the fungi. They, they don't possess chlorophyll, so they depend on external food sources reproduced by spore formulation. Example, we have the mushroom, agaricots, molds, mid, mildew, rhizopores, and the ringworm. Okay, so um, for the mushrooms, they serve as a source of food. And also with the fungi, some are used to manufacture drugs, for example, the penicillin. Okay. So, let's look at the advantages or reasons for classifying organisms. One, it makes identification of organisms easier. Yes, yeah, it's very easy because all the organisms have been grouped in kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So the arrangement is very simple and very clear due to their common characteristics. Also, it makes learning about them very easy. Yes, it's very, very easy to understand it. Yes. Also, for grouping purposes, yes. And also to show similarities and natural relationships between organisms. And the last, also to provide common and general information on the characteristics of organisms. This enables scientists to make references to the same organisms. Okay, hope you had it right. Yeah. So now let's look at the classification of the cells. Classification of the cells. We all know cells are the basic functional unit of life. And all cells are classified on the basis of the presence or absence of a nucleus. 
and if present whether memory bound or not so we have three types of cells one the achaotic cell two the prokaryotic cell and three the eukaryotic cells let's look at them one by one the achaotic cell this is a typical structure of an achaotic cell so achaotic cells they are viruses i hope you've heard of viruses before when they get into your system they slow down the system so they are viruses but they are not called they are not cells because now they do not have nucleus and other organelles so take a look no nucleus no other organelles because they do not normally perform the life processes because they don't have the nucleus and other cell organelles when in association with living cells the dna of a virus seizes the dna of a host and uses it to replicate itself that's a virus that's what it does so viruses multiply very very fast because when they get into the system of an organism they replicate uh, itself they, re they replicate themselves uh, so they are parasitic yes so let's look at viruses in general viruses live inside the cells of plants and animals and bacteria as parasites they are basically made up of proteins and either dna or rna so we can see dna the deoxyribonucleic acid they can reproduce but only inside a living cell that's why they are regarded as a living thing because they can reproduce only when they are inside a living cell and also they are much smaller than bacteria and can only be seen with an electron microscope they do not have the nucleus cytoplasm and the cell membrane some of them can be crystallized like chemicals which are non-living then they have variety of shapes we have the rods we have the spiral we have the spherical and the hexagon and this this is a hexagon one two three four five six this is a hexagon yes yeah, so they are the shapes so they also causes diseases like sore throat, yellow fever, common cold, influenza, poliomyelitis, measles, herbs and AIDS. Yes, yeah, so these are all viruses. Okay. All right. So this is a virus. Now let's look at the next cell called a prokaryotic cell. Prokaryotic cell and prokaryotic cells they are bacteria. They are bacteria. So they are unicellular. They have a nucleus. They have a nucleus, but the nucleus does not have membrane covering it. They may be round or long, single, clamped, or in chains. All right. So let's look at some characteristics of the bacteria we are seeing here. One, they cannot be seen with the naked eye, but can be seen with the aid of a compound light microscope. They, they reproduce by means of binary fission, that is by dividing into what? Two, by means two. The DNA is circular and lies free within the cytoplasm without a membrane. There are few organelles, none of which is membrane bound. Then they have rigid cell wall containing the polysaccharides and the amino acid. They have simple naked flagella. You can see the flagellum there, that's the tail. 
the flagellum is okay uh, another name for the flagellum is the tail you can use the tail which lacks micro nubos. yeah so decay bacteria are important in the soil and they are heterotrophic feeding on dead or decaying matter or on other living things in humans bacteria cause gonorrhea cholera sore throat typhoid and tuberculosis yeah so that's what it does now let's look at the last cell known as the eukaryotic cell eukaryotic cell eukaryotic cell with a eukaryotic cell they are found in the kingdoms protoctista fungi plantae and animalia all eukaryotic cells have nuclei that are double memory bound and other cell organelles that are also double memory bound so let's look at the characteristics all eukaryotic cells have a cell membrane and protoplasm the protoplasm contains both the living and non-living parts of the cells the protoplasm is made up of the nucleus other cell organelles the cytoplasm which contains the cytoplasmic inclusions and non-living components which are together called the egastic substances so look at the diagram we have the cytoplasm we have the lysosome so all these are the organelles ribosome and the rest so yeah so that's it so achiotic cells for virus prokaryotic cell bacteria and a eukaryotic cell we can say man because yes it's part of the um, animalia kingdom and other animals all fall under eukaryotic cell okay so this brings us to the end of today's lesson let's summarize what we just did we looked at the seven life processes as using the acronym remind r we also looked at classification using the carolus lino system giving an organism a two latin name also we looked at the types of cell looked at achiotic cell prokaryotic cells and the eukaryotic cells okay i hope it's well explained thank you very much and see you in the next lesson so you have your assignments look at it do it and forward it to us as soon as possible bye bye